Okay. So hello, thank you for attending my session. I know there's a lot of alternatives, some of which I really wish I could have gone to myself. Um, so here really what I'm here to talk about today is Ember. Um, I'm hoping that uh, I can talk both about where we're at, um, give you some context for how Ember fits in with the wider um, ecosystem of web frameworks, especially because of the fact that Ember is, at this point, a pretty old web framework, um, and also maybe give you some perspective on how you might uh, use some of the techniques that we use in the Ember project itself um, on your own projects. Uh, I focused a lot more in my talk last year where I talked about the Ember release cycle, which unfortunately is not on video, but is online. Uh, with slides. I spent a lot more time uh, on that aspect. In this, uh, in this talk, it'll be a lot more implicit, um, but I'm uh, very willing to answer any questions afterwards about how the ways that we do work uh, may apply to other projects that are not Ember. Um, so first of all, Ember's been around for five years. Uh, it's Ember JS, or originally we announced Ember JS. Uh, Google it if you want to know more. It turned five years old last December. Um, in some ways, five years is a relatively short amount of time. Uh, but when measured in web framework years, it seems like a downright eternity. It's a huge amount of time. Um, Tom and I gave a keynote presentation roughly on the same topic uh, at EmberConf a couple weeks ago. And we tried to remember what it was like to develop web apps when we first started working on Ember. And I think we knew that the web changed for the better. I think we've generally been optimistic about the web's improvement. But I think both Tom and I had repressed our feelings about how terrible it was to build stuff in 2011. Um, the most popular browser in 2011 by a wide margin was Internet Explorer 8. Um, today, for a lot of people, there's probably many people in this room for whom i8 is a distant, half-remembered nightmare. Um, today, uh, if you're using a lot of any modern framework, you get to use language features like async functions, destructuring assignment, classes, arrow functions, and even some not quite standardized features like decorators, thanks to transpilers like Babel and TypeScript and Flow. Um, in 2011, however, everyone was writing ES3. Um, ES5 was actually considered too cutting edge for most people to adopt. And if you know what's in ES5, you know that there's not really even that much there. It was just 2011. Um, also, even like DOM and CSS features like Query Selector, all Flexbox um, were not around at that time. Um, things were so primitive that hard as it might be to believe now, nobody even questioned whether or not you might need jQuery. <laughs> and Ember was also still finding its sea legs at this point. There was no Ember app kit yet, let alone Ember CLI. Um, there was no router. NPM 1.0 wasn't released until halfway through 2011. Um, so Ember apps used the global namespace, and many people included their handlebars, templates, and inline script tags like this. Um, as antiquated as this might feel today, this is more or less how most JavaScript apps were written in 2011. Um, some parts of Ember are embarrassing to look back on. <laughs> um, because Internet Explorer was so dominant, our rendering engine were optimized for the performance quirks of Internet Explorer. Um, I said before that we, uh, Internet Explorer 8 was dominant, but Internet Explorer 6 was still very important in 2011. So DOM APIs were extremely slow in these browsers, so our templates were originally string-based. We rendered everything as a string of HTML, and then we inserted it with a single inner HTML operation all at once. Um, modern rendering engines like React, Angular, and Glimmer all create their own DOM instead of asking the browser to parse HTML. Um, unfortunately, letting the browser create our DOM elements for us led to some interesting approaches to go back and find them later. Um, for one thing, we had to use this awkward bind adder helper just to, just to bind in elements attributes. Obviously, this is not what you would expect to type. Um, even worse was the eldritch horror awaiting anybody who looked at the DOM that we actually produced. And there were some blog posts about this that were less than flattering. Um, and all of that was just to render what today looks like this, and it's very simple, right? So I think in a lot of ways, what we had to deal with when we first built Ember in the first place was rather primitive, and it showed in the original versions of Ember. Um, as bad as some of that early stuff was, however, um, we also have to credit Ember for being ahead of the curve in a lot of ways. Um, in a lot of ways, we pushed the state of the art of client-side JavaScript forward. Um, Ember was actually the first major framework to declare that build tools were critical to any front-end stack, making Ember CLI a first-class part of the framework. Um, and having opinionated build tools meant that we were also able to be the first framework to embrace some next generation features of ES6, like promises and modules, um, to name a few. So basically saying that we were a full stack uh, front end framework that inclu including Ember CLI, including a build tool, allowed us to start moving, uh, moving the whole community towards some features that were not yet standardized um, at that early stage. 
Um, also, this is easy to forget also. Other frameworks have only recently landed uh, compiled templates. Um, we've actually had compiled templates basically from the beginning, from, uh, the, from before Ember 1.0, and we have now moved on to even more um, efficient compiled bytecode format. Um, and indeed, the fact that we've compatibly moved from a string-based rendering engine to a DOM-based rendering engine um, to, our, to even the third rendering engine, our new VM-based architecture, has been one of the keys to our longevity, right? We started off with something that was very primitive, very tailored to the world of 2011, and now is a, a basic, completely different animal, much the same way that JavaScript in 2011, um, those engines work a lot differently than the JavaScript engine works today, despite the fact that the programming language is still the same, but evolving. Um, but maybe the best way to understand the impact that Ember had is actually not the what, like what we did, but how we did it. Um, this is something that we um, added a few years ago is all major changes to the framework go through an RFC process. Traditionally, RFC processes were these things that uh, big standards bodies had, but you would never imagine that a frame, like a web framework would have an RFC process. Um, so major frameworks go through an RFC process. It solicits community feedback um, early and often, and by requiring new features going through a rigorous design process, even seasoned contributors, like even the most, um, the most experienced contributors, have to articulate the rationale and the context driving their trade-offs. Um, I, I often hear from people who, didn't even, who don't even use Ember that they've adopted the RFC process that we use in Ember for their own um, company, internally to their own company, just because of the way that it forces people to articulate the exact reasons behind what, they, uh, what they're trying to accomplish, and then later on allows you to go back and um, make sure that the, re the reasons are still valid. So for example, if we had written an RFC in 2011, we might have said, unfortunately, uh, Internet Explorer 8 has a very slow DOM rendering engine, therefore we have to use HTML. Then if you go back a few years later, ah, of course, that doesn't apply anymore, therefore we can consider revisiting it. So the RFC process to me is maybe one of the keys to Ember's longevity and also something that is very applicable to outside of Ember. Um, Ember was also the first major framework to adopt Chrome's six-week release cycle. Um, that basically means, and I talk, again, I talked about this last year in great detail, we put all new work behind feature flags. Um, that what, that, what that means is that big features, um, like Glimmer, uh, don't, if they take longer, it doesn't block other improvements from getting into the pipeline. Um, we have stable beta and canary release channels, and now LTS release channel. Um, they let you decide for yourself the balance between riding the cutting edge if you want the very latest features, or preferring battle-tested or even um, relatively slow cadence of updates. And that's another thing that has allowed us to make sure that we're able to experiment a lot, move pretty quickly on master, but make sure that by the time something actually makes it into a user's hands that asked for stability that they get stability. Um, Ember 2.0's release process was actually also novel. It was the first framework to release a major new version without any breaking changes. Um, an Ember app running on 1.13 could upgrade seamlessly to Ember 2.0 as long as there were no deprecation warnings. Um, in fact, the transition from Ember 1.13 to 2.0 was bumpier than we would have liked for a lot of people. Um, it still showed how valuable it was that we focused on upgrade paths at all. So the fact that we said before 2.0, every change that we want to remove has to have already been deprecated. There has to have already been a deprecation warning on 1.13. There already has to have been a thing that you can move to that was our policy about deprecations, meant that even though maybe we did too many of them in the run-up to 2.0, and I think uh, that's well understood at this point, uh, it still meant that the vast majority of our community was able to migrate across that bridge eventually. Um, compared to the, new the previous status quo of releasing new major versions that require you to effectively rewrite your app, we believe that Ember 2.0 was an important bellwether that showed that JavaScript frameworks can make progress without breaking the ecosystem. And we continue to believe that this is important. And I think, in fact, basically all frameworks today uh, believe in that. Um, frameworks that, used that believe that they have to break their frameworks periodically have changed their mind uh, at this point. Um, of course. <laughs> Of course, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the Ember router. Um, routers that map URLs onto application code exist in every server-side framework like Rails and Django, um, and stateful UI architecture has also been around for a very long time. Um, Ember's architecture borrows a lot from Coco, but the MVC idea has been around even, even earlier than that. Um, I think Ember's contribution to all this was to stumble onto the idea that in single-page apps, URLs and application architecture are, are intrinsically linked. And by tying the, model, the models and components that appear on the screen to the URL, keeping the two in sync becomes the framework's job instead of your job. Um, around 2011, when we started, uh, Tom and I noticed that 
it was very common that people would say, like, JavaScript has become the new Flash. I try to use it, and it's like, no, like JavaScript is no longer the web. Every, t every time I go to a, a website that uses the web heavily, it feels like everything is broken. I can't really explain why, but everything seems totally broken. Um, I can re if I refresh the page, I, suddenly I'm in a completely different state. I have no idea what's going on. Um, you could, couldn't successfully share links, but you'd say, hey, here's a link, and then you'd go to a completely different place. Um, you couldn't easily bookmark things. You couldn't easily command click to open new tabs and things like that. Um, I think by now in 2017, uh, if you use a JavaScript driven app, you generally don't notice this kind of behavior. Um, and basically, Ember at a very early stage made the URL the cornerstone of how you organize your application. Um, and that helped people build applications that were no longer broken by default. Uh, today, there are really great routers available for React, Angular, and other libraries. And all of them can trace a lineage back to Ember's router. The turning point for, the, in my view, the turning point for the wider acceptance of single page apps happened when, as a community, we started to embrace the URL um, instead of saying that the URL was a, a happenstance that happens to be floating around. And we led that. So that, I think, was also pretty important. So, that's great. That's a bunch of cool stuff that we did that is now everywhere by default. It's kind of like Lisp people are like, Lisp is so cool because of garbage collection. And then it's like, yeah, everybody has garbage collection now. So. so maybe five years is a good run for JavaScript frameworks. And maybe you know we've done much better than most frameworks. Most frameworks die young. Um, so what should our next move, move be? Like a lot, of other, a lot of worthy competitors have come around since we started without all the backwards compatibility baggage. Um, almost all of our standout features like build tools, ahead of time template compilation, our router, server-side rendering are available for competing libraries. So one thing that we could do is we could decide to put Ember into maintenance mode and cede the future to the, the newcomers and focus on catering to our existing user base. But I think none of us really want to do that. Some people have done that in the past. You can find some examples of that. But I don't think we want to do that. No, nobody working on Ember today feels like we're done with the set of things we want to do. Um, and I think, in general, we really believe that it's possible to stay cutting edge without breaking the apps that people have spent years investing in. And I think we have the formula for doing it, which I'll talk about. I also just want to say, in general, I think this is a pretty broadly applicable principle, um, that if you decide to care about uh, not breaking people. And in an application, that basically just means don't break the user's workflows. Don't like completely change the whole UI just because you can. Right? So basically focusing on maintaining uh, compatibility with your user base, but at the same time thinking about, OK, I have, you know, I'm, my user base does this, and my competitors are doing that. How do I keep my users happy and um, also make progress? Uh, in, in spaces that my competitors have come up with new ideas. I think it's hard, but I think there's some good ideas for how to do it, and I think we've gotten better as an industry at doing it. Um, I think specifically the innovator's dilemma, I think we've gotten better at handling. So with the benefit of hindsight, like what are some things that didn't go so well? So it's a little embarrassing to say this, but since I think everybody knows this and we knew it intellectually, but basically anything that was big design up front didn't work that well. And so for example, like we wanted to make Ember easier to learn, so we were like, oh, we want to get rid of controllers from the programming model. So to do that, we were like, let's introduce the idea of routable components. But then it's like, uh, when will routable components land? And the answer is basically never. Um, we also wanted to make Ember more approachable by introducing components that use angle bracket syntax so they work just like HTML elements that people are already familiar with. And hey, if we were introducing routable components, they should obviously use the new component syntax. So we shouldn't introduce a new API that people immediately felt like they have to rewrite. Okay, but of course, now, how do I enable them? Nobody knows. Um, we were also generally embarrassed that the designs of the, the design of the pods file system layout was left in a half completed state, and we considered it to be a dead end for other features we wanted to introduce. But file system layout also touches nearly everything, so the module unification RFC became another design that invisibly delayed other important features. So pods and now module unification. Um, Basically, what happened was all these individual pieces of work felt high stakes because they touched such fundamental parts of Ember, uh, the component API, file system layout. Um, and Ember contributors felt like that this was their one shot to make any breaking changes that they needed to make, um, get in whatever features that they ever wanted to get in. Um, so, and cr so creating this, and creating this inter series of interdependencies also meant that one disagreement on a particular RFC could delay work on another one that from the outside seemed unrelated. So people would look at it and say, I have no idea why Radical Components has taken 18 months. And the answer was there's an invisible dependency graph that is causing it to be behind a bunch of other features that you can't tell. Um, and in general, we just did a pretty bad job of communicating this whole thing. So it's no surprise that 
uh, people perceive Ember to having to, uh, perceive Ember as having slowed down over the past um, year or year and a half, um, basically since Ember 2.0. So the short version is Ember, at, around Ember 2.0, we uh, did a pretty good job of not of making Ember 2.0 featureless, but we had a big ambitious agenda. We did a little bit too, like I'll say, a lot too much up front, big upfront design, um, and, that, and then like a year and a half went by. Um, where we, a lot of the things, not everything, I'll say more in a second, but a lot of the things that we uh, talked about early didn't end up landing in a reasonable amount of time, which led a lot of people to look at that and say, since there isn't progress at so many things that matter, obviously nothing is happening. Um, however, despite a bunch of missteps from the same era, we actually did ship some pretty cool stuff in 2016 that people were able to use right away. Um, so Fastboot is an add-on that people can drop into their app and get server-side rendering with minimal setup with their existing application. Um, engines allow big teams to split up their app into small app, smaller apps that can be worked on and loaded independently, and there's a, a few more examples like this. Um, and really the bottom line is that in both cases, we focused on adding small primitives to the framework that expose the missing capability that then people could use to build an add-on outside of the core. And again, if you want to think about what this means for an for a, a existing project where you want to allow some experimentation but there's too much technical debt or something like that, um, figuring out what is, the, what is the minimal core that I need to expose in my application, in my project, um, in my framework to allow the actual work to happen outside the framework, that ends up being a good way to um, allow people who are, not, uh, who are not saddled by the technical debt to go do the work. In our case, we actually did a lot of the work, right? So um, engines and fastboot were both cases where we didn't feel like we could do the work inside the framework, not only because um, there was a lot of technical debt, but because we felt like once it lands, then we're stuck with it. So we better make sure we land it correctly. But that, of course, creates an infinite loop where you can never land anything, right? So, um, but there's a, much, there's a much lower bar for shipping primitives, right? So if we, shipping, uh, so here's an example. Um, when we first started to work on Fastboot, we didn't realize this yet, but we had to anyway ship a, a little API called Visit. And Visit basically just takes a URL and allows you to programmatically root an Ember app instead of having to change the browser's window.location, right? So an Ember app traditionally is just you working through the browser's URL bar. Um, the Visit API is just an API that lets you say, hey, Ember, please visit this URL and give me back some, some HTML. And while we figure out what is the best way to deploy production-ready server-side rendered JavaScript applications, which is a pretty big project, we can move that experimentation outside of Ember and into the Ember Fastboot add-on. And that basically allowed us to do a decent amount of experimentation um, outside, even though most of the work was actually done by people pretty close to the core team. Um, Engines is actually a similar story. Uh, the RFC proposed a few primitives, like a new subclass of Ember application or something like that. And then after we shipped the RFC, then we shipped an add-on that could build, uh, build the rest of the features inside of the engines feature. But the engines add-on itself doesn't have, to be, doesn't have the same stability promises. It has its own story, can iterate its, uh, on its own outside of Ember. And the idea is once things stabilize, then we can move it into Ember proper, and then people can get the normal stability guarantees. But the idea is that if we ship just the primitives that we need, just the core, um, in an application, this might be like an API. right? Instead of saying, what is the, how do we add this new UI interface? Maybe it will take us like a year to design it. Um, instead if you just add an API, maybe people can work on it. Maybe you can actually build it yourself. Maybe you can build a little iOS app that just does the one thing people really want. And of course, a uh, big thing that we accomplished, if you've been paying attention, is we shipped Glimmer 2 over the past year. That's something that actually got very little play in the like, very big, wider ecosystem because of the fact that it was completely drop-in. Um, however, it ended up being a pretty significant upgrade. Um, basically, everybody who upgraded from, Glimmer, from the Ember 2.9 to 2.10 saw massive improvements in, the pay in their payload sizes after gzip, and massive improvements in performance. Um, this is even people who were pretty um, concerned about regressions, pretty nervous. There, were, there was a discourse, the discourse app, this guy, um, was unable to upgrade to Ember 2.x entirely because of the fact that there was a regression as of 1.13. So basically, we managed to make a release that created a pretty big performance improvement and also um, and also fix, like, recoup some of the losses that we had for certain kinds of applications before. Um, and incredibly, all of that was achieved as a drop-in upgrade to Ember. So basically, anybody who had a 2.9 app with basically no, no changes to any public APIs uh, were able to upgrade to 2.10 and get ha like half the size of their app payload and double the speed, um, approximately that story.
So ground up rewrites, so this, Blimber 2 was effectively a ground up rewrite of a part of our system. They're usually fraught with compatib compatibility peril. Um, in this case, we did a, a trick, we did a secret, um, which was to invest upfront in infrastructure that allowed us to keep both the old and new rendering engine on master at the same time. So originally we had a rendering test suite that tested the original code, what, what was there before Glimmer, and event we upgraded it to simultaneously test Glimmer. So even though we weren't done with Glimmer yet, what we did was we, um, upgraded the test suite to allow us to test both the old rendering engine and the new one at the same time, which meant that as we continued to work on the new one, we didn't accidentally regress the feature set of the old one, which allowed us to take our time to get the new one right without, uh, without effectively being forced. To snow Sometimes once a snowball starts rolling, you're basically forced to do the new one. Um, in this case, we were able to get the, old, get the new one right by making sure that the old one was still under test and the new one was an optional feature that people could opt into. Um, Basically, rendering tests were run twice, once on each engine. We always had a snapshot for how far along we were. And um, we also, another key thing is that we made compatibility with the existing API a goal from the beginning. So there was no temptation to start with a pure re-implementation and like maybe at some point down the road figure out how to bridge the gap. I think that kind of, nobody ever does it and it doesn't end up working out. So going forward, we basically have two strategies for doing what, for continuing to do what we've been doing successfully. Um, adding more primitives that allow people to effectively do the experimentation outside the framework. Um, some of that is uh, Ember core people, some of that is people who are not, uh, not an Ember core just doing experimentation. And uh, also doing in-place upgrades using that same strategy of uh, tr making sure that if you're doing an in-place upgrade, both things are under test. Uh, in general, we uh, want to make the, the rule from here on out that you should not feel like you need core team approval to experiment with new ways of building applications, um, which means that if you have a thing that you w wish Ember would expose more so you could try something out and you have a concrete proposal for a primitive, we'll probably be pretty open to it um, at, a pr at the primitive level. Um, there are actually already some examples, like, so Ember has sort of a spotty surface in terms of the parts of it that are very um, well exposed and very easy to, uh, to build on top of and the parts that aren't. Um, there's some success stories already, in large part because the Ember object model was already pretty well rationalized. Um, so people probably have heard of Redux, which is like a React um, data flow framework. Um, somebody wrote uh, Ember Redux, and not only did they write Ember Redux as a website, there's a whole um, design methodology um, that people can use for Ember Redux. So that, this is not necessarily something I would use in my own app, but the Ember object model rationalization is good enough to allow you to actually do other kinds of um, data flow. And similarly, for the same reason, Ember Concurrency, which allowed you to allowed um, Mokti to completely swap out how um, tasks conceptually work in Ember, um, actually, it's less swapping out and more actually providing something real in the first place. I think what we had was extremely ad hoc before, but basically allowing he was able to do this completely as an add-on with no changes to the core. And that worked out, I think these things worked out pretty well and have resulted in pretty big improvements to people's apps and also likely future direction of the framework. Um, there are a few areas that have not been open for experimentation so far. I put an asterisk there, at least not while using the public API, because of course in practice what people do is they just use private APIs to get, accomplish their goals, but that just means that people using those add-ons feel like everything is very unstable. So um, it, it's, it's a plausible mode for experimentation, but because things are so unstable that doesn't always end up giving good input back into the framework. So um, it's actually, in my view, a good starting point. Like let people using private APIs is a good starting point, but if you don't immediately look at that and say, ah, I see that you are doing this, let me give you an API so that you don't have to do something so private, then you'll, they'll just be churn eventually, the person doing it will give up and people will not be able to use the add-on anymore. Um, so basically the router and components are two areas that I think have been relatively unopened for experimentation. Um, historically, and that has meant that certain kinds of things, like angle bracket components are a good example, that perhaps should have been easier to explore in user space haven't been in Ember. And so I, just in general, if we do decide that an existing feature needs a rethink in the future, um, and I think that, that will definitely happen with the router, um, we're gonna follow the Glimmer model that we followed the first time, um, keep the old f code around, and allow uh, running the the test suite against the new code and hold off merging until 
all until the tests, of course, but also your apps um, work without changes, right? So actually a big part of what made this work pretty well was that even when all the tests pass, of course, getting perfect test coverage is impossible. So um, we were able to keep we were able to keep idling, having both engines around with all the tests running against both engines until the you know until Canary and the beta releases showed that there were no major issues. And there were some things we had to fix, especially around debugging pretty early on. Um, okay. So I want to talk about Glimmer for a bit. Um, last year we talked about Glimmer's VM architecture and we promised a lot of big improvements. Um, we delivered Glimmer in Ember 2.10 and this year we're basically continuing to reap the benefits of that architecture. Um, I want to talk about benchmarks for a second. So people, when they, people look at performance, they try to figure out what is the performance of a JavaScript framework. They, of course, use benchmarks, some of which are created by reasonable people who are not trying to game them. Um, and benchmarks are actually pretty essential to measuring our performance, but they're also dangerous. Um, focusing on the wrong benchmark or just one kind of benchmark can cause you to miss important context. Um, there's this great blog post by uh, one, one of the people who works on V8 who effectively says that they spent years chasing a particular set of JavaScript benchmarks that ended up being counterproductive to making real world um, application code fast. Um, and he ba basically talks about Ignition and Turbofan and how they spent years and years on benchmark competitions, which caused them to be overfocused on getting the peak performance to be peakier, and baseline performance was basically a total blind spot for them. Um, JavaScript libraries have the, roughly the same problem. Um, community discussion, especially in the wider community, often ends up focusing around one particular measurement, uh, and then libraries feel like they have to spend years also optimizing for them. Um, for example, a few years ago it was updating performance and the infamous DBmon demo. Um, and now the focus has turned from updating performance, like how fast can you update all the rows, which is not a real thing that happens in any app. Um, now the focus has turned to initial render times as people have rightly come to focus on improving the experience of users on low-end devices. Um, but there's a point where you hit diminishing returns optimizing for initial render while also without sacrificing updating performance, right? So um, people mega optimize the updating case and now people have started to move on to focus on the initial render case. But there's actually a trade-off here. Um, if you either do more upfront bookkeeping and you get fast updates, and that's what Ember did historically and actually got quite good updating performance even back in the day when Ember was perceived to be very slow, um, or you do a lot less upfront bookkeeping and you get faster initial render, and that's what some of the naive approaches that were um, very good at initial render. And, and, um, and frankly, a lot of applications mostly do initial render and then don't do anything after that or very little after that or can afford an expensive full re-render. So getting initial render to be performant has ended up being a high priority even for frameworks that um, cared about updating performance. Um, we had a bit of a weird situation though, which is that we, since we had spent so much effort on updating performance historically, we couldn't afford to just switch to one of the other approaches that made initial rendering faster because then people compl would complain like, oh, I'm just, all I'm doing is clicking this button and now my, like every, there's like a, total, like a pause for two seconds on my page. And if, you know, if you'd done that in another framework, they would say, oh, no problem, just like put should component update there, it's fine. And that may even be fine, but in Ember we couldn't afford to regress cases that seemed like they should have good performance at all. So uh, we basically had the best in class performance for updating and we had worst in class performance by far for initial render and we were trying to figure out how to square the circle. Um, if you're interested in like more details, I don't want to talk about it too much today. Um, if you're in particular, if you're interested in how we managed to square the circle, how the Glimmer VM maintains better performance by default compared to virtual DOM libraries, um, I wrote a blog post explaining the design decisions that go into that, and I'm planning on writing a few more that go into more of the technical details. Sorry, um, that help us hit our performance targets and check it out. Um, it's on my blog. Uh, all, of that, all of this is just to say um, Glimmer offers a novel approach to rendering component-based web UIs, and it's great that Ember users get to take advantage of it, but what about people who are not Ember? People. So uh, quick, quick divergence. Um, Tom and I both really like watching videos of old Steve Jobs presentations when we're preparing our keynotes. Um, they're, they're just super fun. You get to see like a moment in history that before like Apple was the obvious winner, but still there was Steve Jobs always had a lot of confidence about what he was saying. Um, one uh, presentation that we both like a lot is his 1998 Macworld keynote. He'd been back at Apple for about a year, 
Um, and before he got, came back, like a year before, Apple was literally on the brink of failure. They had no money. They were about to go bankrupt. They had warehouses full of unwanted computers. Um, basically, everybody, the press, the mainstream, media, everybody called Apple beleaguered. People felt beleaguered. Um, but when Steve Jobs showed up, he rapidly turned things around. Um, and this crazy, confusing product lineup that had like millions of computers was replaced with a simple to understand square of consumer and pro laptop and desktop matrix. Um, they delivered the original uh, translucent blue iMac, uh, which showed that they had the ability to deliver innovative products. But unfortunately, it's, uh, despite all this, it's hard to turn around the narrative. So um, the press would give a reason why Apple was doomed to fail. And when Apple would fix that problem, they would come up with a new reason why Apple was doomed to fail. Um, so Steve Jobs said, when I came to Apple a year ago, all I heard was Apple's dying, Apple can't survive. Turns out every time we convince people we've accomplished something at one level, they come up with something new. And I used to think that was a bad thing. I thought, oh Jesus, when are they ever going to believe we're going to be able to turn this thing around? But actually, now I think it's great. Because what it means is that we've now convinced them that we've taken care of last month's question, and then they're on to the next one. So I thought, let's get ahead of the game. Let's figure out what all the questions are going to be and map out where we're at. So basically, this is Steve Jobs' presentation in 1998. He said, uh, I'm just going to tell you, you know, here's all the things we already did. Here's what I'm, I'm going to tell you what we're going to do next. Um, and without being overly dramatic, I think there are some obvious parallels between the 1990s era Mac and Ember. Um, we have a fantastic community and high-profile successful apps. Um, but often it can feel like the moment, like basically throughout Ember's entire history, it has always felt like the momentum was somewhere else. Um, and I know Ember users who have told me and Tom that they felt beleaguered by this common reaction. Like, you use Ember? I thought React was the hot new thing. I had a slide before that had like the, the pyramid. Um, as you see here, Tom even got it from his Lyft driver. <laughs> Um, so when I think about the reasons that people give for not using Ember, there are some that used to be common that I don't hear anymore, like the ugly script tags in the DOM, the lack of documentation were two major knocks against Ember. But we've since eliminated the DOM noise. We've invested heavily in guides and API documentation. Um, we've convinced people that these weren't a barrier anymore. But there are still lots of reasons people don't want to take another look at Ember. Um, so uh, Steve Jobs introduced the uh, Apple hierarchy of skepticism. I'm going to introduce the Ember hierarchy of skepticism. <laughs> And by far, the three most common remaining reasons that I hear for not using Ember are, one, it's monolithic and hard to adopt incrementally. Uh, two, it's too big out of the box, particularly for mobile apps. And three, the custom object model is scary. I want to write JavaScript, not whatever that is. Um, and this year, we're focusing on overcoming the last three barriers to Ember's growth. Um, so basically, uh, I'm not really introducing it here, but um, we're introducing a new project called Glimmer.js, which extracts the rendering engine that powers Ember and makes it available to everybody. It occurs to me that I need to plug in my audio here. Sorry, let's see if this works. Uh, headphones, seem, speaker out, that seems better. Um, so basically what Glimmer is, is it's, uh, we extracted the rendering engine that powers Ember and makes it available to everybody. Um, Glimmer itself is just a component layer, so it's up to you to decide if you need routing or data layer, et cetera. Uh, if you want to drop Glimmer components into an existing app, it's as simple as adding a web component. Um, there's a, I'm going to play a video now. Uh, it's basically the video that we made when we announced Glimmer. There's a little bit of marketing shtick in it, but it also is like a pretty good tutorial for what it, like what it, Glimmer app is. And instead of me trying to do that, I'll just show you the video. And hopefully, it will be OK. I think I have time. Uh, come on. Video. Hi, Tom. Yeah, there's a little bit too much Tom's face in it, to be honest. Hopefully, this will work. Come on. Hi, I'm Tom Dale, and today I want to show you Glimmer.js. Glimmer is a new JavaScript component library that helps you build rich, dynamic user interfaces for the web. Extracted from Ember's battle tested rendering layer, Glimmer is fast enough to be used on the mobile web, so simple that you can learn the basics in just a few minutes. Let me show you how it works. To get started, we'll first install Ember CLI. Glimmer uses Ember CLI to help you get up and running without any setup or configuration. We can create our first Glimmer app by using Ember New with the Glimmer Blueprint. Ember CLI has generated an app directory for us. If we open it up, we'll find that our new project has been scaffolded and is ready to go. Glimmer components are made up of templates and JavaScript files. Let's start by making our first component called Weather Tracker. Glimmer templates are built on HTML, so let's paste in some existing code. We actually now have our first working Glimmer component. Let's try it out by opening the app template, adding our Weather Tracker component, 
and starting the Ember server. If we open the app in a browser, we can see that our weather tracker component is being rendered. Glimmer makes it easy to build data-driven components. Our weather tracker currently has a temperature hard-coded in its template. Let's replace that with some JavaScript data. We'll open our component file and define an object called weather that has a temperature property. We can now display this data in our template using a familiar handlebars-like syntax. And just like that, our component's output is being rendered from local data. Now, our component would be a lot more useful if it was displaying current live data from the server, so let's implement that now. To start, we'll use the tracked decorator to tell Glimmer the data within our weather object can now change. We've just made our component reactive. It will now intelligently re-render whenever the weather property changes. Next, let's write a function that requests the latest data from an API. Because Glimmer comes with TypeScript out of the box, we can write this asynchronous function using async and await. We'll start by writing an async function called load weather. We'll request data from the server and then set our weather property to the resulting JSON object. Finally, we'll kick off this function in our component's constructor so it runs whenever our component is used. And we can see that our component is now rendering data from the server. Let's update our load weather function to pull every two seconds. Our data is now changing, and Glimmer is keeping our templates in sync. Now, you may have heard that Glimmer is one of the fastest JavaScript rendering engines, and while our weather tracker is pretty simple, Glimmer maintains that performance even under significantly more load. But how does that work? First, Glimmer compiles your templates down into a compact series of instructions known as bytecode. Besides being small in size, these instructions are extremely efficient. Since all of your track variables are known ahead of time, Glimmer is able to avoid unnecessary re-renders of your application without any optimization effort from you. When your app boots up on the client, Glimmer's virtual machine reads in your template bytecode and produces a streamlined program to render your data-driven application. This novel approach is what makes Glimmer one of the fastest JavaScript rendering engines, while also being one of the smallest. Glimmer embraces all of the patterns of composition that you've come to expect from a modern component library. For example, we can pass arguments into components. Right now, our weather tracker only shows the weather for New York. Let's update it to take in a zip code as an argument. First, we'll add a second weather tracker to our application, and we'll pass in a zip code for San Francisco. Glimmer uses the at symbol to distinguish between JavaScript data that we pass to our components and normal HTML attributes like class. Now in our component, we can use that new zip argument in our load weather function. And now we can see the weather for San Francisco shows up. In this video, we've touched on just some of the features that Glimmer gives you for building rich JavaScript components. And when you're ready to ship, Ember CLI provides an easy way to distribute those components to existing web applications. The Ember build command gives you a script that you can drop into any JavaScript or server-rendered web app. That script exports your Glimmer components as web components, meaning you can use them in your apps just like you would any other native HTML element. Glimmer's rendering engine and powerful composition story, bundled with cutting-edge features like TypeScript support, ES6 classes, and an opinionated file system make it a joy to work with. We took the same technology that powers Ember and made it simple, small, and lightning fast. And I'm so excited to finally get to share it with you. So go try it out and build something awesome. So as I said, that was way too marketing-y, but as I also said, it has the demo. Um, so I, I, will, I will quickly get back to how this fits into um, Ember, but I first want to talk a little bit, just like repeat a couple things that we sh that we showed there. So one of the things that we were able to do, I talked a little bit about the fact that you can that we that uh, if you if you have an Apple if you have a system that's going to slowly make uh, taking some of it and moving it outside for experimentation might be a good way for you to try out some things that were just being slowed down by the weight of your existing system. Um, so we took the opportunity to clean up some of the APIs that people found really confusing. Um, here's an example. If you're tired of remembering all the magic properties you need to configure 
configure a components root element. Um, in Glimmer, the components root element is defined in a template, so all of that goes away. You can think of the components template as being outer HTML instead of inner HTML. Um, here's the same, same component in Glimmer with just the template, right? So th there are some aspects of how the Ember component system work that are particularly Baroque, and largely they're addressed um, by the Glimmer changes. Um, this actually gets even nicer when you get to uh, introduce dynamic data from the component into it. Here's the, here's the Ember component, um, and here is uh, using, here's the Glimmer component equivalent using ES6 classes uh, to, to get the type data there. So the, the top thing and the bottom thing are equivalent. Um, also, because Glimmer itself is written in TypeScript, it has great autocomplete and type definitions out of the box. Um, every new Glimmer app is configured to use TypeScript automatically. Um, that said, it is important to note that JavaScript is still the primary way that we expect people to write Glimmer applications. Um, because Glimmer is extracted from a JavaScript framework, we, we had to design it to work with both JavaScript and TypeScript from the start. Um, and our intent, our philosophy on, on TypeScript is that TypeScript is an extra tool in your tool belt. It should be something that you can optionally use. But if you don't use TypeScript, there shouldn't be extra stuff you have to type just to, uh, just to deal with the types. Um, so you can use the types or you can not use the types, but it's the same thing either way. Um, Ember users really like computer properties in Ember, but getting used to their syntax can be pretty confusing. Um, because Glimmer uses ES6 classes, you can just use getters, standard getters and setters. Um, also, we use decorators, which is a stage two TC39 proposal that I work on um, to allow you to mark things as tracked so you can specify when things are going to change. And that is how things automatically get updated. Uh, that was in the video for a second. Um, also, actions, if you're familiar with this in Ember, are just functions with some optional arguments. Uh, you can curry things. Um, and so the action helper just becomes a very simple wrapper. Um, also, in the above examples, you probably notice that there's no getter, getter set. You don't have to use getter set anywhere. Um, this requirement also frequently trips up Ember users until they develop the right muscle memory. Um, in Glimmer, we rely on ES5 getters and setters to intercept properties so you don't have to learn get and set. Um, remember that in 2011, ES5 was not actually a thing we could rely on. So this is a thing that has taken some time to, to deal with. And even some frameworks still use some kind of interceptor method approach. Um, so how does this, uh, and actually one last thing, web developers are rightly sensitive to file size. Um, not only do your app's dependencies have to be downloaded, JavaScript has to be parsed and evaluated, particularly on lower end mobile devices, uh, that adds up quickly and people actually notice that if you have a big JavaScript library, it effectively disqualifies you on mobile. Um, Ember has historically been larger in fi file size than its competitors. Um, our line of reasoning historically was for the kind of apps people build with Ember, um, that's all code you eventually end up pulling in anyway and it ends up amortizing over the code that you write, and that actually proves to be true for large desktop applications. Um, so today, a Hello World Ember application starts off with around 200K of JavaScript. Um, in my personal experience, production Angular, Ember, and React apps hover between, between 400 and 700K of JavaScript, sometimes more, sometimes a lot more. Um, but while this is true, that reasoning is true of a lot of apps, it's not universally true. Um, sometimes people have hard file size requirements, like they're building a mobile application. Um, and when people are starting out on a Greenfield app, it's hard for them to buy on faith that they will eventually need everything that Ember offers. What if they don't? Feel safer to start small and bring things in piecemeal. Um, so Shane Osborne recently compared this file size of a Hello World app generated by all the major framework CLI tools. Um, while Ember is the largest, as you can see, Glimmer is tiny. It's 34K, it's smaller than React, Angular, and Vue. Only Preact is smaller. So um, obviously, uh, because Ember, Vue, and Ang uh, React are all in the same ballpark, that competition will probably heat up. We'll probably see things getting squeezed down to the 20s, I would bet. Um, but Basically, Glimmer is now in the, in the right ballpark. So last part, how does it fit in with Ember? So Glimmer.js is tiny, it's fast, it can be adopted incrementally, you can start playing with it already, but where does it leave Ember? Um, the answer is not Ember is, is done, I foreshadowed that earlier. Um, the answer is that Glimmer components, the components that I showed you, are the future of components in Ember. Um, but as I said before, we believe that the key to balancing stability and progress in Ember is to make it easy to do experimentation outside of the core of Ember. Um, the only way to get a sense of something is to be able to use it. Um, and Glimmer components, like I said before, became one of those things that got bogged down in design because of the fact that they were so high stakes. Um, so Glimmer components are the future of, compo of components in Ember. Uh, and we want everybody to try it out, to play with it, to help us 
build it uh, before we make them an official part of Ember. But we're also not saying like you either use Ember now and you have the old syntax, or you use Glimmer and now you have the new syntax, please choose. Um, we don't want to leave Ember users out in the cold. So a few weeks before EmberConf, Godfrey, uh, the person I pair with um, on Ember, submitted a, the custom component API RFC this thing. Um, and it's basically a thing that will allow you to take Glimmer components and put them into Ember. So it's a primitive that allows you to express angle bracket components, Glimmer components, inside of Ember itself. Um, the idea is uh, that you are, will be able to add an add on, create an add-on and pull it into Ember. Um, Notably, this means that we're working on making it possible to use the same Glimmer components that you've seen before in your Ember apps by installing an add-on, like I said. So the next steps for, like the very next steps, the immediate next steps, um, are being able to take a component directory from a Glimmer application and drag and drop it into an Ember application. Um, there's another thing which I briefly touched on before, which is the file system layout. So that's also something that had sort of bogged down <clears throat> over time. Um, but the Glimmer project, Glimmer.js apps use the new file system layout. And uh, I'll talk in a second about that. Uh, but module unification for Ember apps is under active development. And uh, module unification is a stupid name, but it basically means new file system layout. Um, it's under, basically we're actively developing it, we're uh, applying the lessons that we learn, we're exposing primitives so we can play around with it in an add-on. Um, there's a project called Ember Resolver and development is happening there behind the feature flag on the master branch. Uh, Ember Resolver is the one that we normally use. So basically, um, the first step was just drag and drop components. And there's another question, which is how the, the file system layout should work. That's also something that we're actively working on. Um, also, just in general, upstreaming Glimmer code into Ember, um, there's you, things go in both directions, right? Sometimes things that are uh, Basically, sometimes things that are in Glimmer belong upstream into Ember. Sometimes things that are in Ember belong downstream into Glimmer. Um, sometimes things get uh, downstream so that they can be shared, right? But basically, continuing to change the to change the factoring so that things that are in Glimmer JS can be more easily shared between Ember and Glimmer JS project are also the next steps. Um, and in general, the same strategy that we used about keeping things running against both tests, like having changes run against the test suites at the same time, that's going to continue to be the philosophy. So again, the, the short-term goal here is to allow people through add-ons to take Glimmer.js apps, which you could build. You can just build a Glimmer.js app and put it into your Rails app. That works. Be able to take that same app and put it into an Ember app. Um, you actually could do that today, but you would not, you would, it would be a weak performance story because it would be totally opaque to Ember, whereas if you put it in as a real Ember component, then, you would see, then it would uh, combine nicely, would basically get performance optimizations as a whole app. Um, that's basically what is going on. So the longer term, so the short term is basically just allow you to take Glimmer.js um, add-ons and drag and drop them into Ember by exposing more primitives that let you write add-ons, et cetera. Um, longer term, the goal is to break Ember into a series of smaller modules. Um, each piece of Ember should be an NPM package that you can remove if you don't need it. Um, unlike other small modules approaches, of course, things will continue to just work if you need them. We remain strongly opposed to forcing integration work onto application developers. Um, so we're really just talking about breaking things apart um, as, so that you can add things incrementally. We're not talking about making people have to choose between thousands of options all the time. Um, it should also work in reverse. So it, um, if you start with Ember, you should be able to pare it down. If you work from, if you start with Glimmer and realize you actually do need a router or services or data layer, et cetera, you should be able to incrementally NPM install your way up to Ember. Um, this is basically the future that we always dreamed of for Ember, a complete cohesive front end stack for people who want it with the ability to quickly pare it down if the need arises. It's something that I think it took us a few years to arrive at a good strategy for, for doing, and we're not quite there yet, but it's an exciting goal to build towards, and I think we've shown tangible progress already with the Glimmer project, um, and I hope you're, you're all excited as much as we are, <laughs> um, and I hope people build some cool stuff with Glimmer and Ember. Thank you. I guess I have a few minutes for questions, I think. Ah. So, oh, is this on? Yeah. Uh, hey, what's up? So in the, in the video, it, it says that it exports it as a web component? Yep. Can you speak around that? Is it a sure. full-fledged web component? Uh, sure. So actually, uh, the definition of what is a web component is not even well-defined. Um, there's a, As you may have seen in other talks, there's a series of specifications that to in total create a web component. Um, what, it means, what it basically means is um, there's a general problem 
uh, when you have a library, how do I get this to be bootstrapped? One approach is the jQuery approach. You just like write jQuery on document on ready and then you do some stuff. Another approach is the web component approach, which is that you write some HTML and there's a general purpose spec that tells you how to deal with it. Um, if you compile, there's a f uh, flag you can give to the generator and an add-on you can install that basically says, I actually want a web component output instead of a function output. So basically we support both. We support the, J the old approach of using on ready handlers to install things. We also support the new approach of using web components. Um, but basically the, the way that it gets exported as a web component is it just creates a wrapper that has some attributes on it, has a component you put into your, you put into your HTML page and it works the same as the jQuery approach. I'm curious about the testing story for Glimmer.js. What's the preference or the recommendation? Sure. So the Ember testing story has always been that we prefer QUnit because we use QUnit ourselves to test Ember, but we support as a, uh, through li libraries, some popular things like Mocha and Jasmine. The Ember testing story itself is abstracted so that there are various adapters. Um, right now, the, the testing story in Glimmer is that Ember test does something, but you have to set it up. Um, I think ultimately the Glimmer testing story will probably be the same as Ember's. Um, just for context, the reason the reason we have ended up sticking with QUnit for a very long time is that over the over the like 10 years that QUnit's existed, they it has been maintained continuously and has gotten incrementally better all the time. Very rarely is there something that I really want that isn't there within a year or two. Um, whereas pretty much any other testing framework has already been garbage collected by now if it was around sufficiently long ago. So I like personally just have a high priority. Uh, this includes things, by the way, like nested tests and things like that that people wanted for a long time and eventually made their way in. Um, and there's actually a person who works on Ember at LinkedIn who's been doing a lot of work recently on QUnit to add some features that have been needed for a long time. But we, we definitely don't want to force people to use QUnit. I think it's, we understand, I understand that a lot of people use other stuff. Um, the real answer to the Glimmer.js testing question is it's still, there's not a direct answer, except that the Ember CLI testing infrastructure will do something. Like it, do, it, ha, it integrates testum and other things like you can basically wire it up, but it's not fully pre-wired right now. But it should be soon. Anybody else? Okay, I guess. Thank you.